give me if some of this looks like an advertisement. If so, you can you can chastise me later. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to throw all these things up here real quick so we can talk about them. So essentially, what the the IGS profit calculator um, gets at is when we put in the information for a particular set of calves. It is running two different break-even calculations simultaneously. One is a break-even on what we have tried to identify as that quote-unquote average calf in the industry. To give you a sense, that's a calf that is a high degree Angus from a, from a health standpoint, uh, is not extreme one way or the other, would probably be comparable to what folks would, would refer to as like a back 24 type approach. And so in, in some markets are recognized, some would say, well, our cattle in this area are farther along from a health status or an environmental impact status, probably. Um, then on the other hand, there are areas of the country where that might even be a, an overestimation of the health status of the calves. And so what's happening is it's running these two different break-even prices, one for the information on the cattle I put in, one for this average calf, and the report comes out then as the deviation between those two break -even. And then as a result then, since it's a break-even, the higher break-even or the higher relative value, the difference between those two, means that the buyer could justify paying more if that relative value is higher and still break-even. Now, we know that no one's going to intentionally go to a set of calves and say, if they are worth X more, that I'm going to pay that entire X just to turn around and break-even again. That's not practical. That's not realistic. Um, the hope for this entire tool is that we can make feeder cap value, values pervasive within the industry so that we're aware on all sides the true value of the calves that are in front of us at a given moment. And so our belief is, is that if producers have this as essentially a marketing tool, uh, an independent arbiter, if you will, of potential value of their calves, and if a buyer grows comfortable with that independent tool, then they're willing to go a few pennies more. Maybe not the full value, uh, the full relative value difference. In fact, almost certainly not. They're not likely to tie up more cash that they're going to pay interest on and all of those things just to break even again. But if they can buy a few more pennies out of that situation, that's a win. Going forward, this uh, tool will be... Go ahead. Does someone have a question? Oh. Just a beep. I'm sorry. I ignore my ignore my comment. Um, going forward, this will be administered by various staff at the IGS Breed Association partners. There are potential for other folks to get involved in administration of this tool, um, but at this point, that's kind of where that stands. Um, again, of course, you probably know. If not, the, the IGS database is by some margin the largest in the industry, reflects a myriad of uh, breed types and breed compositions and pushing 20 million head. We use mark data in a number of places within this calculator where especially we're especially working filling some voids. I think you we would argue um, we got we have the best science team in this particular field. And a real key piece to this tool is that there will be zero charge for this profit calculator run. That our our goal is to not use this as necessarily a direct means of revenue. We feel like we add value to elite seed stock producers if they are helping their customers move the needle in terms of profitability. So from breed association standpoints, we see this as essentially a service that we offer to our members to help them uh, encourage a greater uptake of, uh, of profit-focused principles as they make decisions down at the commercial level. This is just a screenshot of the interface of the profit calculator. This, this thing is constantly evolving nearly every week. There's a tweak behind the scenes. This is pretty mundane. There's nothing here that's just super exciting necessarily. And to be clear, this isn't a screen that a producer would use. This is a, a screen that somebody who is uh, running the system uh, that is actually uh, handling the, the interaction with the simulator would use. And we'll go to this live here in a few moments and we can punch in a few animals to give you a sense of, of how it actually works. But I wanted you to to, to see that this is the screen uh, that it looks like. Just going to run a couple quick examples for you, nothing too exotic. Um, here's just a pretty normal everyday kind of situation that you all see in, in southern Oklahoma, I'm sure. Um, and so if we were to, to, to compare a couple different sets of bulls, 
Um, we've got a small bull battery of, of low indexing uh, limousine bulls, and we've got a set of high indexing limplex bulls on those Herford Angus cows. For the sake of our conversation, we have a, 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 a preconditioned calf that weighs about 600 pounds. I'm getting a little feedback, and so if it continues to get bad, if you all are hearing it, you can just meet, mute your side until you have a question. It might reduce feedback if, if you're hearing that as well. All right, here are, here are those two runs just kind of overlaid so we can see them together. On the left, what we have done is if you look at the top, we in both situations we have steer calves with average weights of 600 pounds. They're moderate in flesh. They're not super thin. They're not super fat and fleshy. These calves have, have been weaned for over 30 days. You can see we've checked a small box there. Um, they have been vaccinated against BRD. Those are two areas that the, the scientific literature is very clear that that has a positive impact on mortality rates, morbidity, morbidity rates. And so there's some impact uh, in the calculator and all, because those boxes are checked to reduce both mortality and morbidity. And so there's a health status that, that gets better because of those are checked. You can look there. There are two gray bulls. And when we input these, and again, we'll show it to you live in a minute, if you, in a few minutes. But when you input these bulls, the Titus bull and the Mr. Warden bull are full women's and bulls. Both are very low indexing from a profitability standpoint. We go down lower. We can enter the maternal grandsires on a cow herd. We can essentially build a cow herd by by their own sires and actually get a, a pretty clear snapshot of that cow herd. We also realize that probably as often as not, if, if maybe not the bulk of the time, those sires may or may not be may not actually be known. And so we needed a mechanism to look at um, a situation without knowing maternal grandsires. And so we use mark breed differences to accomplish that. And in this case, we have a cow herd that we do not know the sires, but we do know that they are Angus Herford cattle. And then under to steal Wade's terminology, um, again, just EPDs and accounting. So this machine cranks out its numbers and generates um, using the EPDs that are built from those two bulls and the marked breed differences that come from those Angus and Herfords. And then some of the assumptions from the accounting that you see put in up at the top and it generates the, the biological outputs you see at the bottom. Now, and we'll talk about those because there's probably a couple that make you scratch your head just a little bit. Before we talk about more on the bottom, on the right, we have those two high indexing bulls, uh, the Magzale and Magzionism bull. Both of those bulls are on the top end of, of the limousine population for their mainstream terminal index, same Angus Hereford cow base. And you can see in this situation, there's about a, a nearly a $7 difference per hundredweight or seven cents a pound difference between the calves that come out of there from a, a relative value standpoint. Now, we can see there are some issues on the bottom that probably have caught your attention. And if you look at the feed conversion rates, the days on feed, potentially the carcass weights, and the yield grade, and the number of choice and yield grades, your gut might be telling you, and I think accurately so, that the simulator is feeding these cattle too long. And what happened, what is happening is it's feeding these cattle to a point where their conversion drops just a little bit, they're on feed just a little bit too long, the carcass weights on occasion get a little bit too heavy. A lot of the cattle grade, in some cases, maybe a little bit of a, a, an overestimation of their ability to grade. And as a result, sometimes the yield grade fours and fives get way too extreme. For example, uh, the group on the right, nobody, Nobody is going to feed a set of cattle to where half of the cattle, 52% in the situation, get deal grade fours and fives. And so we're just not looking to take those kind of discounts. So what's happening here, and Wade can speak more to the, to the science behind it, and we've identified this, is essentially um, we're going to have to find a mechanism to truncate this based on either weight or yield or fat cover so that we can cease and, and, and turn off um, at some point how far out this simulation runs. That's something the team's working on now, so that's not lost on us at any level. We know that that's there. Uh, some of this has to do with uh, the age-adjusted endpoint of mark data instead of a finished adjusted endpoint. And so I'll hold my water and let Wade speak a little more to that if he wants to. Um, he can either chime in now or, or chime in a little bit later. But through this simulation, that's about 40 bucks a cat, even given the fact that the second group 
is distinctly heavier in terms of condition. So I'm going to throw up another. Yep. Go ahead. One okay. question, just clarification before you go on. So looking at those yield, gra yield grades where you have, like, say, on the right side, 48% being one, two, and three. So that's saying that if you had 100 head, you know, or however many of these exact same type calves, that 48% of them would be in one, two, and three, 52% being fours and fives, correct? Exactly. Or a 48% chance that this single calf would be a one, two, and three. Correct. So Chip, this is Kurt. I have a question about what if we have known historic carcass data? Is there a way to either backdoor that by adjusting the cow herd, or is there a way to enter known carcass quality? At, at present, no, and I will let Wade speak on that. I'm sure he has an interest to say something on this. Obviously, the most powerful thing is if we can get that information put in on sires, and if we can put information in on sires and get their their genetic predictors more accurate, we can incorporate them as maternal grandsires and get a much better snapshot coming in that direction. But I'll let Wade make a comment on that. Or maybe I won't. So uh, <clears throat> I've also got a question on that. You know, you, you mentioned that the uh, it's it's not doing a good calculation on yield grade one twos and threes, or it looks like uh, you know choice or above. You know, that's that's pretty optimistic. Uh, but also, I'm assuming once y'all fix that, it'll also correct for carcass weight. Because I'm a, uh, you know I'm I'm yeah. going to make the assumption that uh, that carcass weight is going to adjust, but may not go down as much as as you might anticipate just because you adjust your yield grade. So the, the, they're going to finish out probably higher yielding, but still probably very similar on carcass weight. Because so, the number of days on Yeah, so so essentially we all of this stuff is all com tied to that same singular piece that these cattle are getting fed too long. and so. A number of these things will come back, and you're probably right. Carcass weight probably won't come back as far as some of them will, um, but but there will be some adjustments. And again, the 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 math works great. What we see here is behind the scenes. The, the mathematics of this makes perfect sense, but the reality is that we know we don't market cattle on a on an age constant as mark data would suggest, and so we will then have to put in a piece that says, okay, once you hit a certain fat level or a weight, which typically are the two triggers to decide when cattle, when you've said, okay, I've, I've, we've gone far enough, you got to go. So once, or potentially conversion rate, obviously. And so we can put in triggers that just truncate the, the calculation at that point in time. And then we probably have something that's a bit more reflective of the real world. And so we're, we're very comfortable in terms of how we've acquired these numbers, and we believe that from an EPD standpoint, again, which we have a tremendous amount of confidence, obviously, in that side of the, uh, the equation, but from an EPD standpoint, we're comfortable here. But once we truncate those, you're exactly right. We are going to back up, for example, on this right side. I don't think we anticipate these cattle to grade. We don't expect cattle that are essentially a quarter Hereford and, a, and roughly a quarter Limousin uh, to grade 99%. I don't think that we anticipate that to happen. Um, that's likely to back up as the yield grade percentage goes much uh, one, two, and three goes much higher, and as maybe we go from days on feed to 283, maybe back some number of days. And so um, that that's something that uh, again Dr. Spangler is working on right now as we speak. He and the programmer and Wade uh, had conversations about that yesterday. And so again, that that's moving forward at a pretty rapid clip. But I want to just show you essentially all the warts and all, so that you know exactly what we're seeing, so that you feel as confident. And, and that way, when we come back to you in some number of weeks and show you uh, the updated version, you'll be like, okay, gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah, One other Chip, question. Uh, yeah. uh, I just wanted to say that I, I, uh, I've had trouble with my audio through the computer, so I've logged in through the phone. I uh, thought I was talking. 
giving an eloquent response and I was talking to myself. So anyway, if you guys have any anything, I, I did hear everything Chip had responded, but responded to, but I think one of the things I'd like to respond to is the, uh, the, the question about adding uh, existing, basically phenotypes, adding existing information from herds, and, and I, I suppose you could develop a, uh, a system that could incorporate information from um, known herds past information, but um, it's pretty difficult to get, being you're just dealing with raw phenotypes, it's pretty difficult to leverage that uh, to much of predictive um, ability um, without having it turned into the form of an EPD, which is obviously what we're doing. This is all driven off of EPDs. So, that would kind of be my response to that. Uh, we had talked about something along those lines, uh, but it's just getting to that point and then knowing how to meld it. I mean, we, we know the EPD is having information on the sires, the known, known sires. It's going to get us, from a genetic standpoint, the best prediction we can get in how to you know, meld any additional information that would come directly from commercial herds would be would be pretty hard to balance that even if you wanted to try to incorporate the information it would be difficult I think the one other question I had you know we were talking about the endpoint for the cattle and that you know typically that's driven by fat or weight you know and I agree but there are times as we've seen in the market where because of market conditions, People have kept the cattle longer than they probably should have, or some of those things. And I just wondered if there was any way in this, or do you just totally leave this out of the equation of being able to take in some of those market type implications, or include, you know, like you have to anticipate a price or feed. You know, is that are you assuming that people are going to be using, you know, futures price? And I guess that's my I guess that's my question. Is there any way to account for those market conditions in this? Well, I, I'll speak to that. Um, or I'll try to speak to that. So, um, starting off, this this model, if you're into simulation modeling, is what you'd call a a model that has a high level of ag aggregation. In other words, we're not getting down on the biological level uh, when it comes to modeling. We're using very uh, um, high level um, relationships and so forth. So. Um, that's that's one thing, and, and because of that, things like Chip mentioned that, okay, so in the real world, uh, if you have cattle that tend to get fat quickly, uh, you're going to kill them earlier. Well, at this time, the model doesn't have the artificial intelligence to do that. Um, we probably are going, as Chip mentioned, we're going to make some modifications to it, uh, in order to reflect things more realistically in the real world, but at the end of the day, our goal really isn't to get down to lower levels of aggregation. We're really simulating biology, you know, at the at the root level, and um, because of that, and and one of the reasons behind that is we're giving the primary use of this will be for producers who have some you know, a pen of calf to sell and they come to us and they want them valued and that value is something that is going to be used across the board. And for example, you know, there might be, you know, a number of people at plan or a number of pens that are going to sell on uh, superior auction. And to make, make it a fair comparison, apples to apples, for those buying those pens of calves, we're going to make some mm -hmm. assumptions that are pretty general. And you know, though they're general, they're they're going to be for the most part, um, you know, fairly accurate prediction of using them will give us a fairly accurate accurate prediction of outcome. Now, if you get into things deeper uh, biologically, if you want to simulate what happens if uh, you, know, you wean your calves early and put them on feed right away, or you um, wean your calves and put them on the stocker program and then put them into a 
uh, feedlot, those kind of things, we're really not equipped and probably don't have the intention to get to that level of, of simulation. So I guess that's a long-winded way of saying that, you know, there's going to be some things you're really wanting a, a biological model that gets down to the roots. This isn't this isn't it. To, uh, to add one piece. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just a real quick question. So on the top uh, up there, the very last line in the top box where it says base carcass price, is that is that uh, I'm assuming a futures price? So that's a great question, and actually I was going to, that's exactly where I was going to go next. So as Wade said, what we really want to do is, in particular within a, a given window of a feeder calf marketing period, those three economic assumptions and then all the premiums and discounts that are built in on the back side of this thing for uh, quality grade, yield grade, carcass weight, those sort of things, our, our goal is to keep those as static as we can within a given feeder calf marketing period. Now, recognizing there could be some major catastrophic things that have a huge shift in corn or something like that, in which case we would adjust. But what we would look to do is actually those three pieces would not be adjustable from the, the, the typical administrator of this program. Those would be set and established per the, 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 the management group or the oversight group, and those would say static for a period of time. Now, your question is great because and maybe one of the things that you know Wade was kind of hitting at on, on one side of this and, and kind of to the earlier question is you could have a version of this or folks who had an access to a version of this where they could adjust those things more extensively. That's not difficult to do um, should we have a reason to do that to give a group the ability to adjust those. So if I were a feedlot individual and I wanted to maybe utilize this tool and should we go down that road to use this as a tool that might become a part of a break-even stem, they very much would probably want that tied to the board. In fact, we're quite confident of that. At present, those are just current prices. Uh, that's actually not a current price, as you all know. If you uh, looked at any carcass prices, like 160 isn't current. But for the most part, those are going to stay in the moment USDA-based prices. Now, we very much could tie them to the board, and there's a lot of reasoning to do that. And, and so we're open to your perspective on that. We're not married to that approach one or the other. Uh, my, my thoughts are is, is, you know, if we've got, in this example, you've got uh, basically nine days difference on, on days on feed, but you could have a significant difference on days on feed. Maybe maybe it's where it's enough where it uh, pushes the marketing of those cattle from one contract to another. And we've seen, especially in the recent, recent history, uh, there can be significant differences on that uh, that uh, fed cattle price. Uh, it may be a five to a six dollar difference moving from one contract to another, and that that to me would be a uh, maybe I'm wrong, but to me that would have a, a pretty significant impact on that break even value. So yeah, one thing though, one thing I'd keep in mind though, if so, we're not trying to predict. Actual, we're trying to predict relative outcome. So, yeah, there's no question that you know what what you just mentioned can shift, break even can can fluctuate up and down in a very short period of time. But what we're actually predicting is less less variable. So we're predicting relative values. So if a set of calves um, versus another set of calves is worth ten dollars more a hundred weight. Um, it, there's no question that, you know, from one week to the next, um, the break-even cost could go, you know, you could have a buck fifty break-even in a few weeks or even less time than that, jump up to a buck seventy. You know, that kind of thing certainly can happen. But what, what tends to not happen with very much frequency is the relative value. So if there's ten dollars relative value between those two sets of calves, you know, when they're at a buck fifty, say the one's average and the ten dollar is more, that's the buck sixty, and and you tend to see pretty similar relative values, um, you know, regardless of the break-even price. Though that I'm not saying that the break-even price 
couldn't affect the relative value. It does some, but it's it's much more invariant than just predicting break-even price. So we're we're really not we're using break-even, but we're not um, making any claims about it. It uh, predicting the actual break-even. Wade, could could you, um, you or Chip, go and say again what the how you determine average? Well, we have a set of we've taken from our database um, over a four-year period, the most recent four-year period, the average characteristics. Where essentially it's average ang, it's an average ang set of calves. We've taken the average characteristics for all the rates that affect profit in the feedlot. So we've got the average, we essentially calculate an average intake, an average um, gain, uh, average carcass weight, average marbling, and average yield rate. And that's based off of, those are average EPDs. Um, we equate the EPD to the actual phenotype. The phenotypes we're getting from Meat Animal Research Center. If you go to Meat Animal Research Center, it says the average Angus carcass is I don't know, 900 and some pounds. The average Angus uh, uh, marbling is is 5.2, and you know those kind of things. That's where we're getting the phenotypes. We're mapping them onto the EPDs, and and that's how we come up with this this average steer. And we just reason that you know the uh, maybe average isn't the best. Maybe the maybe the uh, well the the mode maybe the mode is the best description of what this average is because by far the most common steer to run through a pen of steers to run through any kind of a sale would be Angus. They'd be Angus steers. So we're we're doing the best we can to uh, mimic the average the set of a average Angus steers based on all the characteristics that impact uh, feedlot profit. Okay, so so if you so then if you wanted to, I mean, depending on where you're at in the country, you know, say you go into the southeast and there's a lot more Brahmin influence. So so if you wanted to make your your comparison to something that's maybe a little different than that average, could would you run just essentially what you've done here with on the left hand side? You've got what what somebody here could determine we think is average, and then on the right hand side, what our producers are trying to sell. That would that legitimate? Yeah, that that certainly could be done, Brian. It'd be a matter of you know just like we did with Angus, come up with what we are you know the best estimates we could of the average Angus feeder calf, you know, and that we've set that as a base. And you know, if, if we were to, if someone were to want to, now it's not set up to easily do that now, but that wouldn't be a major undertaking. Um, we could, you know, we could essentially set up any kind of genotype as the average base. If it was a straight, you know, if somebody wanted to compare to straight Brahmin, we'd go to Meat Animal Research Center and get the characteristics of the straight Brahmin and and do the best we could to map them onto the EPDs, and and we could certainly do that. You know, we the reason we we picked average Angus is because that, like I said, that's by far the most common feeder calf that would be running through across the country. I'm sure there's areas where it's, you know, it would be skewed, uh, and you wouldn't have straight Angus calves probably down in in Mississippi, places like that. Okay, I I can't I can't say. My, if I could chime in one thing there, I can say having talked to a number of producers, one thing, especially those that we would consider fairly aggressive, progressive commercial producers, what they like about the concept of having a, a standard mode or a standard average animal is that they have the ability to maybe convince an order buyer or a feedlot buyer that they're different than their uh, geographical region, region might suggest. For example, we all know that feedlot buyers build in a discount for the southeast. It's just a given. It's the way life is. However, if 
someone has some sort of independent tool such as this to suggest that they are more reflective of a Midwestern or an Oki or a, a Nebraska situation, they might deserve a bump far above what their uh, typical zip code or geographical region might uh, denote. And so that's, that has been one thing that a number of progressive producers have mentioned as they see that this gives them a chance to say, hey, my cattle are on, are on par with those in, in southwest Kansas or wherever. Uh, because they see it as somewhat of a, an even playing field. So, but no question you could do either way in what in way more than articulated. Okay. Yeah, and I think actually getting a little bit deeper into this, so when we talk about relative value, if, if you look at EPDs, that, that's what EPDs are. And and so we know, we know, if, you know, there's no sense People all call up and they'll say, "Well, what does a plus two birth weight mean?" I want I want to know if that's going to be 80 pounds or 90 pounds. Well, the reality is we can't do it worth a hoot predicting actual phenotypes, but we can if we're going to say, "Okay, if a bull is plus two for birth weight, another bull is plus ten, You know, the relative difference between those bulls is eight pounds in birth weight. And we can do, generally, we can do a pretty decent job of doing that. And it's kind of the same concept here. We know um, that putting out an absolute value for break-even, uh, we're not going to be, we're, we're for the reasons you guys have mentioned, that can shift dramatically in no time at all. But the relative value, just like is with EPDs, you know, that stays fairly invariant over time. So. So is the back to back to the average is 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 the average an unweaned calf that has not been vaccinated against BRD? That's a good question. Chip Chip has been dealing with that and trying to get at what are the typical because now you're getting into management questions. What is so? What we try to do is say what is the typical management exposure of the average set of feeder calves. And Chip, I'm not even sure where they've settled on that, Chip. Yeah, I, I can handle that. So it's a, it's a great question. And so what we have done is, is try to come to an answer that seems to be practical. And so yes, first the first case situation is we ran, we have ran, we run that without either of the two things you just mentioned. Um, and, and so that's the way that's been running. Um, we have, we're curious from time to time whether uh, there should be a little bump um, because certainly large portions of the country would say, well, um, we do have a better herd status than, than nothing. But at present, with the vehicle that we have set up, more or less the simulator, for example, the one on the right, it's running exactly what you see in front of you. And simultaneously, it's running that high Angus steer that weighs 600 pounds. It's not been weaned. It's not been vaccinated with the same economic assumptions on the same. So you're correct. So, so the steer on the left, it it only has the fact that it was weaned over 30 days and vaccinated against BRD with all its genetics. It's still only worth three cents a hundred more than an unweaned, unvaccinated. Correct. Average. And it, and if you and if you were to see the EPDs on those two bulls, you would understand why. They're horrendous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> One other question I thought of, Paul Rissett, here is, you know, you talk about the simulation or simulating what these values are. What we're seeing there in these relative values look like deterministic output. Are, are, is there a stochastic component to this um, where you might give these relative values where they're arranged? Yes, actually, there is a stochastic. There are stochastic elements to this. Uh, so, uh, essentially, what happens? You generate a pen of calves that have means for the traits of of economic relevance. So, you have means for average daily gain. You have means for feed intake. You have means for marbling, yield grade, carcass weight, and so then you generate based on an assumption of variance, um, we uh, generate um, random normal distribution 
uh, around those traits. And, and the reason that's really necessary, it's particularly necessary when it comes to pricing for things like uh, uh, marbling and yield grade where the pricing is not linear. And so because of that, you really need to have a population, generate a population with a mean and, and standard deviation some distribution around that mean to um, to correctly price things. And so what ends up happening, for example, if you start out, um, if you assume just a, a linear um, a linear price when it came to marbling, in, in other words, if you went increased, each unit of marbling gave, yeah, um, Chip's going to go to that. So he might as well describe because he's been doing it. No, no, no. Go ahead. I just wanted to put it on the screen. No. Well, I just so in this in this slide, this shows that. So if you have high marbling cattle, um, already if they're high marbling, you start out with a mean that's pretty high, and most of the cattle are already almost all of them are in the choice area. Um, increasing that population for marbling. Say you increase it one unit. In each case, high in the top graph and the bottom graph, we're improving marbling, uh, but we're starting with different means and and so forth. So what do you see happening with high marbling? Increasing marbling more doesn't gain you a lot, given what we're the assumptions we're making there uh, for pricing. On the down on the bottom side. You know, you've got the same distribution, just different means, same variance, just different means. Increasing uh, marbling in that case can make quite a difference because you're pulling the big, the big uh, increase. You know, you're going from when you go from select to choice, you're gaining six bucks. This is actually typical. I think we're modeling in our simulation. I think we're using about eight dollars if I'm. I recall, but anyway, there's a big threshold that if you cross over that threshold, that's a big impact. It has a big impact on the outcome, and if, of course, the fatter part, if the fatter part of your curve centers around that threshold, it makes quite a difference in the outcome, and so that's mainly when you talk about stochastic uh, components, the index, that's where they exist. Um, going back to my earlier comments, so from a biological standpoint, it's it's very um, uh, we don't we're not modeling biology at a low level, so we don't have stochastic elements involved. You know, very very um, well. Being we're not at a a low level of aggregation in a model of the, of, uh, the biology, uh, the stochastic nature is primarily just to catch the the differences when it comes to pricing, or the interaction, basically, the interaction between biology and, and uh, uh, prices. And that's actually why we need to make it. There is so, so this is the underlying backbone of what we're doing goes back to economic selection indexes. You know the, what an animal breeder would call a, a selection index. Well, and they're typically most selection indexes are static, and so you plug your your uh, genetic parameters in and your prices, and and uh, and you use that from a, you know, and it's static. In this case, we recognize that because we're simulating, we want to cover large populations, in fact, the whole beef cattle and even dairy, Chip has been working in the dairy world, dairy cattle populations, in order to do a good job of that and catch this interaction, this interaction between biology and uh, economics, in order to do that, we need to re-simulate. We need to have a, an interactive system where we could re-simulate every time. There's another, there's another, uh, uh, or a couple of other Profit calculators out there, but they do not leverage. Uh, they do not re-simulate. They use a static, essentially a, st a static selection index, index where the weightings are the same. In our situation, it shifts because 
um, because we're re-simulating every time we we run a, a new scenario. Well, as Wade was talking about that, and again, that is, to be honest, that is one of the key pieces, the fact that we actually have a better reflection of the genetics involved, in particular, as producers can put in more information about maternal grandsires and that sort of thing. We do a much better job of, uh, of actually understanding that picture, but again, at a, at a, big, at a, at a macro level, um, to uh, allow that, uh, those bell curves to shift, and that's been a a, a big area of excitement uh, for those who've been able to see this and, and watch the numbers change. And, and, and this slide kind of gets at that a little bit. Um, what you see here is a situation where we have the same three sires in each simulation. You can't see them all because they're kind of covered up by each other. But um, three sires that are uh, popular Angus bulls. Uh, here we're marketing heifers. They weigh 550 pounds. Base carcass price is 170. And if you're familiar at all with Gardner Momentum or Basin Pay Weight, uh, again, very impressive bulls from Terminal Merit. Uh, Keneally Power Surge is another one that's very impressive in terms of Terminal Merit. And so these three could all be AI sires, and all the cats could be AI sired, or you could assume that Momentum and Pay Weight were AI sires and you were part of the consortium that owned Power Surge and he was a walking bull for you. And by the way, we do have the ability to adjust the percentage weighting on those sires. You actually see a link there that says enable custom sire representation. We could say, for example, <laughs> that momentum and pay weight sired 75% of the camps. Maybe we have an AI program and you got 75% of them out of those two bulls. And then the other quarter came from Keneally Power Search. You could do that. In this situation, they're all viewed equally. And so they get a third of the weighting. But you can see as we look at the different cow herd types how those curves shift and move. And because of the tremendous genetic merit in those three bulls, on all situations, they're quite positive. But you can still see a pretty distinct difference as we go from that baldy calf that is has a premium of, of roughly 13 cents a pound over that, again, that quote-unquote average calf. And then we go to that straight bred Angus who gets a little bit of a bump. But then when we start adding in the fundamental principles that we know to be true in terms of uh, heterosis, you start to see as the continental breeding comes in, we get a quarter continental in there. And the third scenario, and again, a pretty distinct bump up of about three and a half dollars a hundred uh, over the straight bred cattle. And then as we go to that 50-50 British continental, we get all the way up to, uh, again, nearly a 21 cent a pound or a a little over a twenty dollar a hundred bump on those calves. Again, to be clear, we we caution the producers who have seen this to not think that you're going to get twenty cents extra a pound for your calves because you're just not going to do that. But the reality is, is, if you can prove to the buyer that, and again, especially over time, as folks like myself and other and their colleagues work to make for awareness with feed yards, to buy order buyers, to those major marketers that are in the middle. And again, we're having those conversations as we speak. Um, as they become comfortable with these, they, or this profit calculator relative value output, you know, if they look at that $20 number and say, okay, fine, I'm not paying you $20 more, but I might go eight cents or something with you. I might ride a little ways and pay a little bit more at the, in that particular situation to get calves that I know have bred in value. And so that's something that we, certainly caution folks to see. But this shows you exactly what Wade was talking about. As you shift that cow herd around, uh, you certainly uh, can move those. And I'm going to skip over yeah, these. Wade. That, you know, if you have these pieces in here where you have the variance associated with it, that would be even more powerful if you gave those relative values in a range. You know, so yeah, the mean may be 20 bucks a hundred, but it's, you know, 16 to 22, or is it 13 to 27? Um, you know, and I think that probably would aid that conversation with producers a little bit more. Duly noted. I'm going to skip past this real quick just because Wade did a, a better job. Again, just to show that we can bring in, the, the beauty of this system is obviously from an IGS standpoint, we have 12 different breed associations collaborating, so getting their cattle are, I mean, instantaneous. 
but we also have a mechanism, and I'll show you that in a moment when we go to, to run this thing live. We can bring in registered cattle from outside of the system as well. You see a bull like Final Answer here, and certainly that's a bull that is highly, we all know, he's very popular and used a lot, and certainly he's in our database as well. Um, and so you can see he populates that way. Again, you can see that shift in the cow herd base in the bottom and what that does to his value. And again, it, it, a neat component of final answer is if, if you happen to be familiar with that bull, he's at the absolute top tier of the Angus population in almost every category, save back fat and yield grade. Much like a lot of common Angus, you know, a lot of contemporary Angus cattle or a lot of the derivat derivatives and hybrids that have a lot of Angus breeding in them, those cattle tend to be fairly fat. And so, uh, as you can see, the mark data reflects that when you look down on the bottom, especially when you breed final answer to straight Angus cows. But you can show where some of these bulls, and so customers, commercial customers can see, a lot of bulls have populations they can be successful on. Just all too often, they're not on the population they're most frequently used on. And so, there are a lot of Angus folks using final answer. I would encourage them, and again, as a family who uh, being close to folks who uh, have a lot of those black cows at the house, um, that's just not a bull that makes sense for us. But he certainly works really good on our Semangus cows and that sort of thing. So same example with a popular Simmental bull. He makes more sense on making 50-50 calves. Even he's, he's good at making straight Simmental calves, but there's more value on the other. Um, there's a lot of numbers, so I apologize. But let me tell you what you're looking at. We have recently shared this with some non-IGS breed associations because we want them to know that we're going to evaluate their cattle. We have the capacity to do that and we want them to be comfortable with our what we've come away with. And so in just the last week um, I, I presented this to the folks over at the Herford Association. I showed them we broke these numbers down a lot more so that because they know these bulls uh, a lot better than you and I would are certainly better than I would, and we talked about each little group, each color grouping, just a little bit independent, and then we put them all together. But here you're seeing essentially the yellow lines are those bulls in that population who have the highest terminal value through their CHB index. The bulls in that kind of pinkish color in the second tier are still in the very elite stratosphere of Herford bulls. Um, they're in the top 200. You can see they rank from 196 to 200 in the certified Herford beef terminal index. The blue line is the, the Herford's maternal index, what they call their, their Baldy maternal, uh, maternal index in the blue, and then at the bottom is their Cavanese index. And so these are trait leaders in, in each of those categories. And then, again, the, the EPDs you see in the middle are EPDs that are adjusted over to a Simmental base so that we can run them through this system. And then you see what they look like when they run across those different cow herds, much like we saw in the other screens, but just without all the magic, we just got down to the number. And so you can see um, where some of these cattle are going to uh, struggle from maybe just a feeder calf valuation standpoint. That does not mean that, and that would not dare suggest that that, 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 that that is the only measure of cow profitability. In fact, I think we all know that maybe in some ways in the last number of years our only focus has been on the size of the check that we sold calves and in turn uh, there's a lot of black cows out there that are not as fertile nor as longevity-minded as they once were. And so we're not suggesting that uh, this is the only barometer by which you measure the profit of a cow herd. But when we look specifically at the feeder calf profit, it probably doesn't come as a huge shock to folks that if we go straight red anything, they're not as profitable as when we responsibly cross them. And again, the Hereford population has not been selected in mass for terminal merit. And so as you see that column, uh, over there towards the right under Herford, not an overwhelmingly uh, popular column to look at if you're, if you're looking to straight breed Herford cattle. But as you get more Angus blood in there, or as you get back over and get more continental and Angus blood under the Sim-Angus column or just straight continental blood, you can see there are a number of bulls in this situation that can be very popular. And they're not all necessarily the high, the bulls that are the most uh, prevalent in terms of their CHB index. For example, a bull that got a lot of conversation the other day with the Herford folks, um, were, were actually there were two of them that got a lot of attention. One was the Scular 9U bull who's down in the blue section. And there's a bull that isn't world leader in terms of their numbers, but he's consistent 
and he works on a lot of populations. And you might note he's one of the unique ones on here in that his score against, if you look at his relative uh, value on straight Angus cows, he might be the only, or if not, he's one of the few that has a better score there than he does against Simmental and Simangus cattle. And you're like, well, that's a little bit unique. Well, why would that be? Well, actually, when you look at this guy, what happens is, is, is the Skular bull acts a little bit more like a continental relative to his population. Relative to the Hereford population, he's extraordinarily lean. He's quite heavy muscled. And so as a result, he actually works a little bit more like a continental, so then it wouldn't come as a huge shock that his greatest value might be against a British animal that adds some marbling like an Angus. And so it's capturing that. And to be honest, when we went through all these with the Hereford folks, they were very tickled. They felt this did a really good job. They felt like this, this ranked those cattle um, in a way that made sense to them. And so I, I just wanted you to know that uh, those folks have seen these numbers and felt pretty good when we left that meeting. This screen is a set that in, in interest of full disclosure, I've not been able to show them to the Charlotte cattle folks just yet, but I've just been putting them together so I can catch up with those people in the near future and do the same. And again, it, it doesn't come as a shock. Now, here's a population of cattle who've been selected to a high degree for terminal merit. And you know in your neck of the world, uh, there are a lot of white bulls chasing cows around, especially as you get farther even south from you. You all are well aware of that. Again, up at the top, we have those that are in the top tier or their terminal sire index. That pinkish line are cattle who float right around the 25 percentile for that index. The blue lines, those who are on the top end of their maternal index, and again, the top end of the calving ease index at the bottom. And so what you can see, again, another situation where you see a, a, this population gets much more positive from a feeder calf value than the other. Again, I, I don't think that's a big epiphany to anyone because, again, they've been sorted for that. You can see some uniquenesses in here, uh, but you can see in general it tends to uh, line up fairly well with the terminal merit of those bulls, with the bulls being towards the top, um, having a, a higher degree, a higher relative value. In fact, you can see a pretty unique bull in there. I actually skipped and grabbed him. He wasn't the fifth bull in line. He was the sixth bull. There's a bull called One Penny Blanco, who's actually sixth in the terminal sire index of the Charlet breed, but has to this point been the the highest relative value of any bull that I've been able to find in their breed, mostly because he's solid in the traditional strengths of Charlet, um, but is quite exceptional in terms of marbling relative to that population. And so actually that, that allows him to be even a better fit against a straight continental like a Simmental or a high continental like a Simangus because of that added marbling. So um, just wanted to show those numbers to you. And if you're you can take a picture there. You can see Wade. He's even smiling. I know it's a little bit nauseating. Uh, if you don't know some of these folks, though, uh, it, 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 it's a great group. He's I only wanted... smiling because it was a candid photo. Otherwise, it would be no. <laughs> oh, he, that's right. You, you nailed that. You nailed that. Hey, while you all are pondering, I do want to show you that we can just jump into this thing one time and, and show it to you live. And I want to show you a couple pieces of how it would work, and, and feel free to be asking any questions, and if I've skipped out of a screen too fast, I'm sorry, but I do want to take a moment to, to at least show you how this thing would function in the real world. So here it is, it's running live, and let's just say for the sake of our conversation, we've got, again, 575 pound steers. Again, uh, they're a little bit, they're, they're a little fleshy in this group, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, let's just say the reality is, is prices are a little bit higher now, so we're going to call this one 175. We use a couple of different bulls here, and, and I want you to know we could put in a very extensive bull battery. Uh, Wade, you might actually know the number. I've never hit the number. I've put in as many as eight bulls as direct sires, and I've put in as many as five bulls per year that were maternal grandsires so that I had a screen of, oh, I don't know, the, the better part of 30 bulls or so. And so you can go that far if you want to. Um, to save you time watching me just punch in numbers, I don't think we need to do that. But I want to show you two examples. I want to show you how we would import a bull from an outside breed, but then I also want to show you how we would do this. And so, um, so if I had Chip, a bull that's in, yeah, go ahead. Chip, just a thought. You may not have much background on what integrity beef is, but the the majority of these cattle are Charlay sired on Angus type cows. So. Uh, in one of the 
it's a lot of you know high growth, top 20% winning weight, yearling weight bulls, but low accuracy. You know, so um, that'd be something interesting if we could do whenever uh, to look at that. So just want to throw that in there real quick. Go ahead. Yeah, they're going to be about okay, two well, to three on a sire. Okay, very good. Yes, we can absolutely do that. I'll go ahead and punch in uh, a couple different versions. One, just so you can see how it works. I'm just going to use a, a couple, you know, one or two bowls that are internal to us, and so you can see how we would do that. And again, we can use, in fact, a lot of, a, let's just say, a very large proportion of popular Angus sires in our database, so we could easily add them as well. Um, here is uh, a, a Simmental bull that's quite popular. I'm going to put in a, a, a Red Angus bull. So is that just Hi, their Rick. registration number putting in there? Their universal IDs, yes. Okay. And, I, and we can leverage any of those 12 groups that are within us. We can automatically search our database that way. I'll show you how we'll grab those other ones in just a second. So universal again, ID. Just, to, yep. uh, just real quick, universal ID, that's not the, the breed registration number. That's some sort of a different uh, or have actually, you Typically, they're a, a similar thing. Actually, the universal ID typically just has that registration number with a, pe a prefix relative to the country that it was originally registered in and then a breed code. And so you can see here, I don't know how we okay. can see it from where you're sitting, but right here it says USA SM, and then this 2614607, that's his registration number with us. And so this just becomes his universal ID. I can put in a, an Angus bull, um, and I put it in as USA AA, and then his reg number. Okay. Yeah, and if you want, it's actually Interbull. It complies with Interbull, and Interbull over in Europe is kind of the, the governing body of of all things identification wise and so uh, as Chip says it you know you got a got a country code and a breed code and then typically the um, the reg number from the breed where it originated. Now one of the things we struggle with some is you know there's a lot of bulls anymore that are in many different breed databases so that throws a bit of a monkey wrench into it but uh, but we do if you want to read up on any of that stuff just you know, Google interbull identification, and they so there's all kinds of information about what they, how they operate, or how they, what their protocol is. Okay, so here, that's just an example of how this thing would run. This is a, essentially a Simmental Red Angus program, which is a reasonably common program within some parts of the country, and so you can see a, a pretty popular high-indexing bull and. In our population, uh, in the Simmental population, the Frankly bull is a, a pretty popular high growth Red Angus bull, and just putting them on uh, mark breed assumptions uh, for Red Angus Simmental uh, unknown maternal grandsires, you can see the relative value associated with those. Now, I'm not going to take the time to do it, but I will show you how we put maternal grandsires in, just for the interest of time. Uh, we could we could say we were retaining 15% of heifers. I could say I know seven years worth of bull battery, and what I would do is you can see here it's going to click all the way back those seven years. Here's one and two don't matter because obviously they don't have calves in this population. And so I could put in those reg numbers right here, and again I could put in a number of them to represent that particular year, um, and again I can go all the way down and, and fill that out for all of those years. Other things to show you while I'm here, you can see when I hit this link here, it immediately came up with a 50% and a 50% here. Now, I could change that if, in fact, uh, the Tebow bull is reflective of 75% of the calves and the Frankly bull now is worth 25. And by the way, it won't let me put in numbers that don't make sense. It will uh, it'll balk at me if the math doesn't add up. And then I could uh, go back to what I did before. Uh, just for this. And that's not a surprise to me that that would go higher because of Again, while this bull is good within his Red Angus population, the Tebow bull is excellent within the Simmental population, and so he went up just a little. So I want to show you how I would add in a custom sire. 
All right. Oh, forgive me. I don't know all these bulls off the. I don't know all the Charlet bulls off the top of my head. So uh, I'll give you one that. real quick. Hey, be great. Go ahead, Robin. Now, okay. Well, yeah. Here's the, no, hold, hold on a second. To, to do it, I actually have to, at present, uh, the program is pr uh, currently building in a mechanism to where I can put in the direct Charlet EPDs. I can't, at present, I have to have converted them prior to um, and, and adjusted them over by using mark for crossbreed adjustments. So I can't just import, at, at this point, a bull directly. I have to do some math. To put him in, and so if you have one, I mean, I could do it. It would take if you've got a few minutes, I can adjust him. It's not that hard. Um, it, while you, are, if you have questions to wade, I can certainly do it. If you have a bull you want me to look up, I don't mind doing that. I can give you one that's uh, heavily used in, in okay. our uh, right. lines. You want the okay. name? Or you want the? Uh, what do you want? Registration I'd, I'd number like or the EPD? Do you, I, I prefer his reg number. If you have his EPDs, I'm not going to argue, but I can go get them while you're chatting. I've got all that sitting here in front of me on my phone. Uh, his okay. reg number is E. I'm sorry, I got his reg number as well. Yes. All right, registration number E M six six five nine four eight. Okay. And which EPDs do you need? The TSI. Okay. No, what I need is birth, weaning, yearling. I'm going to give an, I'm going to ask for a number of them. Let's start with those. Birth, weaning, yearling. Okay, birth is 2.4. Okay. Weaning, 38. Okay. Yearling is 68. Okay. Now give me, um, give me the uh, carcass weight. Carcass weight, 27. Okay. Can you give me back back fat ribeye and marble. Back fat point zero zero three. Okay. Ribeye point six. Okay. Marbling negative zero point one eight. Zero point one eight. Okay. All right. I'm gonna let you uh pick Wade's mind for a minute while I uh pull his numbers up, okay? So, so you're not actually using the TSI that they've recently developed then? No, no, which is which is actually some of the Charlet folks are actually pretty pleased with that because when, when I've talked, I actually talked to a Charlet breeder um, this morning or late yesterday, it all runs together. And, and again, the TSI is just an index that comes from those same numbers. And right. they were pretty pleased to see that, that our use of EPDs came out and found a similar situation to where uh, – those cattle were ranking similar to their TSI, which isn't a big shock. I mean, indexes work. We're firm believers in indexes, and and they work. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds like again, I'm not a Charlotte person. I have heard there had been a little bit of scuttlebutt amongst this person and that about you know was it ranking them correctly? And certainly, I wouldn't have a comprehensive awareness of that. But I can tell you, in the limited number of bulls that I've ran, it sure seems like it's it's hitting the mark. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn my screen off for a minute while you all can talk to Wade, and I'll run these for you real quick. It'll actually make me just a few minutes do some math. Okay. You got any questions for I guess Wade, I was kind of curious. You know, y'all are continuing to work on this. Um, what is the timeline for kind of I like, roll out or use uh, publicly available, or you know, in terms of if we want to gain access and use this, or um, what? What are your thoughts on that? Wait, uh -oh. did we lose you? Oh, sorry. I guess I had <laughs> I was on mute there. Uh, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I figured you Brian didn't want to hear anything. me. <laughs> Brian didn't want to hear me anyway. <laughs> so. <laughs> So anyway, the yeah, the game plan is to have something that we feel comfortable with and and uh, does what we feel it needs to do for its purpose out sometime this spring. Uh, we've been hesitant to give drop dead dates because, um, as you guys know, when it comes to this kind of stuff, developing technology, 
you get thrown curveballs now and then, and so so having a drop dead date usually is not a good idea. But uh, but the game plan is this spring. You know, when it comes to any kind of research stuff, in our our philosophy has always been we just share. I mean, we would I don't think we'd have any trouble. We'd have to talk to the other um, the other people involved, but if you guys um, were interested in the fact that you're you've got a research application, you know, we could certainly share with it with carry it with you at pretty much any point in time. Um, that's generally how we do things. Um, we have, you know, and, and the other thing is it's, uh, you know, it's always going to be a work in progress. There's um, always going to be room for improvement, and that's the way simulation modeling is and most any technology is. We'll, we'll see improvement, indirect improvement through, you know, an enhanced DPD prediction. It won't be long. We're going to have a new platform. And we actually do. We, we, we roll out a trait stability. Uh, we rolled out the first what's called a multi or single step um, EPD on a large database when we calculated stability before Christmas. And that, that means that uh, we're incorporating, we now have the capability of incorporating DNA calls directly from the lab right into the evaluation uh, directly. And that has pretty powerful and increases our predictive ability substantially on young animals and you know that's what most of most of what everybody deals with are low accuracy young animal you know, I'm sure most of your producers if they're buying bulls you're dealing with that category of animals and in general that's you know what our what most everybody's dealing with in the beef industry. So that's going to enhance our predictive ability on the biological side. And then we'll, like I say, it's going to be a, always be a work in progress and we'll work to enhance and add features and those kind of things over time. But, you know, yeah, we shoot to have something from a production standpoint, something out um, this spring yet. Can you, all see my can you all see my screen again real quick? Yes, we can. Wait, this is Deke Alcar. I was curious if you would maybe run an overall or a very broad general value determination based on, you know, a general cow herd description across all integrity beef producers, and then we could give you a list of many sires or you know maybe even all of them but definitely multiple sires to give us a general idea across the whole integrity beef cow herd. Would that be possible? Yeah I think uh, you know if we assimilate the sires they've used on the, the calves and the sires of the dams and those kind of things um, we can do that we can come up with we can even do it external you have uh, if the sires are in the evaluation and have EPDs, you know it can pretty quickly be done even external to the the simulation to come up with a you know a set of EPDs that would be comparable. We'd use the mark the cross breed adjustments and put them on whatever base you wanted. Typically, people want an Angus base, so. You'd, if it sounds like you've got a lot of Charlet cattle in the mix. I don't know if you've got Charlet females too on top of that. Um, but but anyway, we could put something together. Uh, Chip mentioned so we, we're right now we're limited to 20 sires um, when it comes to the sires of the calves and the sires of the dams that we can input into uh, the, the simulator into the feeder profit calculator. But that can easily be ramped up too. You know, so we could. We could conceivably use a simulator if we ramped up the number of sires allowed. We could, um, you know, we could get a gauge through the simulator on what the, the genetic level of the herd was or a population. So, what? We, can, can we, you give me more background on what this I, actually I gonna, is? I was going to say real quick, uh, if needed, we can provide you with every sire that contributes to the calf crop. Uh, either by ranch or if you just wanted it just as a, a whole listing, but 
that is a requirement that they have to pre provide the alliance with the uh, the sire information for every calf that's contributed to the calf crop. So we we know every sire. And they're, so they're evaluated sires. They're in they're in, they're in some database or some genetic evaluation. Yes, yes, they have to be registered. Uh, the 2016 calf crop, uh, or excuse me, the 2017 calf crop, the course that's being uh, born right now, will either be Angus sired or Charlay sired. In the future, mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, opened it up to Red Angus, but of course we won't see any of those at the earliest until 2018, uh, with, with, what, with one exception. We do have one producer that was grandfathered in with Red Angus. And then we're working on waiting on a proposal from the Hereford Association uh, uh, to develop a relationship with them. But for the 2017 calf crop, it'll be probably three quarters, two thirds to three quarters Charlay sired, and then about uh, the rest will be Angus. Well, probably the, the quickest way to get a gauge, you know, if you look at the cow herd, you know, you pull in EPDs on the on the sires of the the females are raising the calves and then you know I don't know you know in most cases you just make a general assumption you know within a herd that they're siring animals equally um, although there might be cases where you vary that and give different weightings so so for instance if you had a herd where half the half the daughters were out of an AI sire or what were out of AI um, you know, you could vary that, and then you just weight things accordingly. And of course, you could do the same thing on the calves, and to come up with a mean, and that could fairly quickly be done in a spreadsheet if you had the EPDs um, to get a handle on that kind of thing. And then, uh, but before you started, you'd want to, you know, you're going to be pulling if you've got Angus and Charlay, you've got two different bases, EPD bases, so you'd have to make a conversion. You'd either convert the Angus to Charlay or vice versa, and then then proceed from there. Sure, and Wade, this uh, just from my perspective, I don't know how much uh, maternal sire data there's going to be, but yeah. uh, there's some producers that know that. And then the other thing to speak to your point there would be probably two different simulations. One would be integrity beef cows with Angus sires and then a different simulation for integrity beef cows with Charlay sires. I think makes sense. Robert, you agree or disagree? Yeah, I, I would agree on that. Yeah, I think one of the things, so, um, so when it comes, when it comes to no, did we lose weight? Yeah, it looks like his phone might have dropped, but he'll, he'll come back on. Okay. Well, while while he's uh, working that out, uh, let me show you what we've done with the, that bull example that we had a moment ago, so we can identify him and. Um, again, I could put his name here, but I just at this point I didn't. Um, we can keep track of him, especially as we go forward. We'll be able to track that guy and this, um, his reg number. This terminology here will change. The programmer is changing that to his universal ID or his registration number. These are the EPDs on that bull once he's converted to a Simmental base. And so this is again the EPDs of relevance uh, for the uh, for the feeder profit calculator. So are there any questions on that? Because once I hit the next button, those will go away. We won't be able to see them. Fair enough. So I could put in, now he could, again, because you know a lot of the groups that we work with um, or, or some other associations might have composite animals. In this case, it's 100% Charlay. So we'll add him to the deal. Now, you can see this bull, and I didn't put his fancy name or anything of that nature in, but he put in just like all the other bulls that we had seen to this point. He's, from now on, he's figured exactly the same. And so if I understand correctly, it sounds like uh, the bulk of these bulls will be going on uh, with high likelihood on, on high Angus cows. Oh, 
and saying, log me out. So, all right, hold on. I, I sat still long enough, I guess, that uh, it's going to make me log back in. I know how these things work, so we'll go over here and we'll do it again. That's what happens when I sit still very long. That's how Wade keeps me motivated. <laughs> <coughs> He's a heartless, ta heartless taskmaster. That's just the way it is. So, um, anyway, I think we used a fleshy one in that previous example, so we'll leave it the same. And I think we're at about 175. Again, so we're gonna. Well, you're gonna get. Some, that's him. So you're gonna see, get to see me walk back through this one time. I apologize for that. Yeah, I did. Sorry, guys. I'm really struggling here. I. Uh, Lost connection, and then I had to dig up all the access codes and stuff to get on back on. But but anyway, I was just quickly to I was um, going to speak to the fact that yeah, most most commercial cow herds on the downside, you're you're typically shooting in the dark. But what you can do that that does certainly add value is you get some uh, at least a brief. You get some so this is breed. Um, and so if we know, you know, if we know the cows, you got a set of cows that are half Angus, half Semitol, you might know, not know, or half Angus, half Charlet, you might not know what they're sired by, but at least we can get a mean estimate on those breeds, you know, where they're going to set for the various traits. And so um, you definitely want, if as much information as you can get on the dams, and if it's only if all you have are breed makeup, you know, in some cases you don't even have that, I guess. But if you have breed makeup, that's certainly of value. So here, so herein is the uh, the relative value of that particular bull. Um, you can see pretty clearly still uh, the the bark breed assumptions are doing a few things that that we know need to get better. We're not going to feed these cattle 300 days or 299 days. Uh, the feed conversions get a little poor on the, well, they don't get a little poor, they get fairly poor, uh, again, because they're going too far, carcasses that are flirting with 1,000 pounds, and this group's probably, the, the percent choice is probably reasonably close, um, but probably the yield grade one, two, and three is actually going to probably eat a little bit higher. But again, it gives you, again, from a relative standpoint, it gives you a sense that these cattle are, are worth Eleven dollars and fifty nine cents more per hundred. Does that does that line up a little bit with your perspective on this bull? Yeah, I've got a producer that has used a lot of his uh, bulls, and that bull's uh, he's actually an AI sire. What we'll see is he'll come in about uh, seventy five percent choice or better, seventy five to eighty percent choice. Uh, yield grades one, two, and three would be down just a little bit. Deke, that's the uh, that's the field rep bull uh, that. Uh, Rusty uses has a lot of genetics out of Deke. So that, that, that's pretty close. Uh, of course, carcass weight is a little higher, but I think, like you said, that's attributable to trying to feed them for 300 days. So did, this, did the breeder pick that? Did the breeder decide to use that bull based on an index? Is he a pretty high terminal indexing sire? Yes, yes, he's a pretty, very, very uh, high indexing. He's got high accuracies, uh, yeah. well-proven. Yeah, like like Chip said earlier, one of the things, you know, we, we generally, we see a pretty, pretty good ranking with, uh, you know, how, how the animals rank on selection indexes. One difference, though, is that we're, like I said, the selection index is kind of a one-size-fits-all and one scenario modeled, and you know, yeah, if you have that exact scenario, we'll probably be even closer. But with the feeder profit calculator, we have the latitude to simulate, you know, quite a bit of uh, alternative scenarios and, and pricings and all that kind of stuff. But generally, you know, a, a selection index of an animal sizes, you know, a lot of people are asking, gee, should should we be using the feeder profit calculator to select sires? Well, no. Um, it's 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 uses the same concept as a selection index, but it's got some things like we we factor in heterosis in the feeder profit calculator. We pull out heterosis purposely 
in the selection index, you know, and, and it, all kinds of numbers, number of other things that make a selection index um, the tool you want to use for making selection purposes. The feeder profit calculator, we, we really need to make it clear to producers that it's not a selection tool. It is, it's to use to get a, you know, the best prediction we can come up with, with for what a set of calves is worth. But, uh, Wade, but yeah, if you're if you're using high terminal index sires, they're going to size up good on the feeder profit calculator. So wait, that that leads to my next question. If that was a low accuracy bull, how much would that relative value change? Would it go yeah. away completely? It's it, yeah, it's not tied to accuracy. So so the beauty of EPDs is they are. Um, so if you start out with no knowledge, you, take, you say you take a population of cattle, you have no knowledge of what those cattle are, the best estimate would be to call them all the same. You know, whatever the mean is, that's what the set of that population is. So as, as you gain more and more information, you see more and more spread in EPDs. And so that is why it's statistically OK mathematically okay to not factor in accuracy because accuracy is actually factored into the um, the calculation of the EPDs. Um, so it does not affect the value. Uh, we're using the EPDs, you know, whether they're high accuracy, low accuracy EPDs, we're using those as predictions of the biological merit. Then the other part about this is is that when you when you take a basket of EPDs or a lot several sires a, a number of sires um, <clears throat> the means of those we're using means of those sires the means of those if you take say for instance you take five young bulls and you take their means their mean EPDs that would be equivalent to using a high accuracy sire you would see um, the variation or the the um, movement, the air in those EPDs collectively, those out of those five sires, would be probably equivalent to a high accuracy single sire. Okay. Uh, so accuracy isn't factored into into this. Thank you. A quick question on up there on that uh, the last box before the output, where you have dam breed one and dam breed two. Uh, is that just taking it? So, a 50, if you change that to say Angus and Brahma, would it be assuming that the 50% Angus, 50% Brahman? Or can you put in there that it's? Yeah. So we, you know, we know we in this part of the country we'll have a lot of what we call ultra blacks. So they're going to be sure. probably like a three Brangus. sixteenths. You know, under you know, you know, they'll be a little under you know, purebred Brangus type scenario. Yeah, so you can see that that is moving. This relative value moves with that herd exactly as you just re described. And so, again, this isn't necessarily the ultra black distinction. Um, it's not even a Brangus distinction, but it's it's reasonably close to an ultra black because it's a uh, you know for the sake of this conversation, and you can see that changes. And if we put them on some tiger stripes down in Mississippi, uh, I'm guessing this will get a little bit less beautiful. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Uh, and, and so, you know, so that's what you see. If we get down there, and, and of course, there are a reasonable number of Brahmin continental crosses down, especially in your world and south. And so, again, you can eat that back up. As long as the Brahmin blood stock in there, you all understand there's, those, those are, there is profit to be had in that cow herd, but it's more on the production side than it is on the feeder calf value side. So, uh, so this is not a, a knock of the place of those of those girls, but they're making more money on the in the pasture than they are at this point. So. Just, uh, just out of curiosity, do an Angus Brangus cross. That'd be kind of that super or that old black, black type. type. That'd, be, that'd be about as close as we can get. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Sorry. Hold on. Okay. You can see that that pushes that Brahmin content down rel relatively low at that point. So, you know, this gets back to kind of the my, my thought process earlier. Uh, you're setting a static 
spread for yield and grade or for uh, for quality grade and, and yield grade. So you know it, what we tell our producers if they're going to retain ownership in the yard, you definitely want to pick a yard if you've got Brahma influenced cattle or or even some continental type cattle uh, that you'll probably want to. You're going to want to sell them on a on a yield basis, not on a on a grade basis, to be able to try Understood. to put, put you know, instead of trying to bang a brown bank into a square hole. So the question it, it, that I get is: is there is there an ability uh, if if we're working with you guys on this to to, to change some of those grid characteristics, maybe? Yeah, so Chip had mentioned that, so we've been talking with Meat Animal Research Center. One of, one, of the, one of the struggles is that, as Chip mentioned, the Meat Animal Research Centers, their data is uh, assuming animals are all killed the same age. Well, we know that that's not the case. We know that if you had a set of uh, uh, semitol High proportion semitall feeder calves versus a high proportion Angus set of feeder calves. The Angus feeder calves would die earlier, typically, um, because you know you're going to run into yield grade problems sooner, and and uh, and so you're going to pull the trigger. Um, but in the real world, so our EPDs, though the irony is, our EPDs are actually on a finished constant basis. Uh, for example, when we get a set of Say we have a uh, somebody that puts 300 calves on feed. Those calves will probably be killed in three different groups, and so and those groups become the temper a contemporary group for genetic evaluation. Uh, and in that way, we're essentially sizing up cattle. We're coming up with EPDs, genetic differences for traits, marbling, and yield grade, and so forth, based on um, when they were actually deemed to be finished. So, so anyway, that's kind of roundabout way to say that we're we're working on things that that we we think will, you know, improve improve the um, our predictive ability. Um, Meat out research can help us. I, I think there's some they have some data where um, we can make some adjustments to where we're instead of an age constant, we're on a a finish point constant. The other thing is we can add, like earlier I mentioned about artificial intelligence. If we ramp up the level of biology in the simulator, we can put in artificial intelligence that says that, you know, you simply don't feed a pen of calves until, you know, you, you simply don't feed a pen of calves beyond some target yield grade. You know, that might be, you know, 20 percent forest and better. So you put that in, and then you know it has a corresponding re uh, effect on their carcass weight and their marbling and all the other factors. If you're uh, killing them sooner than you typically would, based on the mark. So mark is assuming that we just take them all out to this this set carcass weight, and uh, and basically the same age. And that's that's really where the when you see those funky results, that's where that's coming from. And you think you'll have that fixed by by spring? June one, is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're good. Right. Spring. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was kinda like when you were working on your thesis. We were trying to find a lot of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do seriously though. We we really are like Chip said. Chip's been really working on it, and and uh, you know, ideally, we would come out. We'd have something ready for production. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, and like I said, it's it's a work in progress and always will be. But we're kind of shooting to have something out this spring that be good enough for good enough to do with what we feel it needs to do. But I'd say it. It's really, really cool, and it's one thing that we've always struggled to get at is what is the the value of these cattle, especially on the the genetic side. And so, 
like like you say, I mean, we can we can maybe assign some different values to what the the value of that backgrounding is and things like that. But this this gives a, is a pretty good tool of evaluating the genetic side of it. So yeah. really neat. Yeah, and we've had a lot of discussion about that with Chip and everybody else involved about how, you know, we know that most break-even calculators and, and most most uh, people that are feeding feeder calves, they have a pretty good gauge, or whether it's just a, a gut feel or, a you know, an actual objective, something objective that they've got plugged into their their break break even calculator that you know puts a value on the wean calf and puts a value on the vaccinated calf and puts a value on castrated calf and those kind of things. So, you know, we realize our primary the primary thing we bring to the table here is the the genetic component. That's that's really the primary thing we bring to the table. In fact, we're going to split out. So we're going to move to where we have a relative value. We publish a relative value that's solely based on genetics, and then another relative value that's based on the, the uh, management parameters or the non-genetic factors, um, so people can, can keep them separate. And if you have already got all, all the other non-genetic things factored in, you don't need to get, you don't need to double count. You know, you don't need to use our uh, non-genetic assumptions or non-genetic calculations, but very few, I don't know of any other than a couple of other uh, calculators out there that would have, you know, account for the genetic component of values of set of feeder calves. That is, that, way hit the big point for those of us internally who are working on this is as we try to develop some level of awareness beyond the, the producer level mostly so that that generates a little bit of pull through, a little bit of recognition uh, of, the, uh, of the brand, of the logo, of the marketing mechanism, so that there's, there, there's some recognition. And as Wade just more or less said, we all know that those on the feeding end use color, ear length, and horn status as a proxy for genetics. And so if we can give them a, a simple measure that gets purely a genetic relative value, it might be something that has value to them. And, and we've had contacts with significant, significant entities that have suggested that. I think putting those things and, together, powerful, being able to split the genetics from the management piece. And, you know, I think, you know, for us, we've been really curious in that genetics piece, but then also, you know, how do you evaluate or how do you um, put a value on those management pieces and it allows people to kind of change out or, you know, compare what they think those management practices are worse, and so I think that's real important. So just so you know, there are a few pieces that we will put in here that when this thing goes live, the way this will work is it will generate essentially a digital certificate. And so a digital certificate will put in all of the inputs that the producer gave us so that if the producer tells us they were weaned on X day, and so it hits the 30-day mark, and yet those calves show up to whomever bought them, and they still got milk on their mouth and they're bawling. That's on the person who gave us those that information, not on us. But we'll also have some other information on that certificate that we think is useful for buyers. Um, if they were implanted, what was the date? Um, you know, if they're horned, you know, are they horned or dehorned? Things that may not necessarily belong in this as a break-even calculator or a relative value tool but actually do provide some service to the folks who are looking at this to get a better handle on the caps. So. Just just curious, um, are, are you guys planning on working on a, a maternal side, maternal component to this? Um, no, because that, you know, that gets into the, um, the maternal component we have would be obviously the plugging in the sires of the dams and the traits, you know, the traits that are, you know, the only traits we're simulating are the traits that are relative to feeder, feeder calves, uh, the value of feeder calves. When it comes to maternal, you know, we've got, we've got our selection indexes. Uh, we've got a, the all-purpose index that factors in, you know, cow herd traits as well as 
you know, the, the traits that, that impact the cattle that go into the feedlot. Um, so we've got that, and, and like I said, we strongly encourage, or not only strongly encourage, we really, we don't want, we absolutely don't want breeders using this feeder profit calculator as a, a selection index. You know, even though it has, you know, the, the backbone of it is, it's the same methodology as the selection index. It's, it's uh, you know, it's not something we want breeders using as selection, and if if they're going to keep replacement females, they need to be using, in our situation, they need to be using the index we call the all-purpose index. Uh, in other breeds, they call it other things, but that's what they need to be using. And, and because in our situation with the all-purpose index, we factor in, you know, it's called all-purpose because it factors in the feedlot, the packing plant, and the cow herd. All three of them are factored in and weighted appropriately. All the traits are weighted appropriately. And so, you know, if you're keeping replacement females, you use that index that counts for maternal characteristics. And generally, because it also accounts for feedlot traits, generally high API cattle generally do pretty well on the feeder profit calculator. Now you can envision a situation where they don't. They might be so superior in the cow herd traits, you know, they might have extreme longevity, um, you know, extreme maternal calving ease, direct calving ease, those things, and then not be so spiffy in the in the feedlot. You know, and under, under that scenario, um, they might not shine so much in the feeder profit calculator, but we know they don't have to worry about that because they're making up for it in the in the cow herd. That, that's just one thing we've all, you know, people struggle with because you know, I agree you, you have the all-purpose index, which kind of gives you a relative value among sires there, but then when you, you know, breed that, breed your Semangus sire to my Hereford cow and then I re produce that replacement, I'm, what's the value of that heterosis, which you've captured here in the feeder, the feeder yeah. side of it, we still struggle with that on the female side of it. It's well, yeah, and... where you, yeah, where you're going, Brian, is is he actually getting into a decision support? Colorado State years ago, Dorian Jarek started it. Um, he started along the path of a decision support tool, where you would plug in. You know, it's interactive, just like the feeder profit calculator, and you could put in there you had. Straight Angus cows, you crossed them on, or straight Angus bulls, you crossed them on Hereford cows. You had these baldies, and it would factor in heterosis and, and everything it needed to, to factor in to predict profit. Um, but that's, you know, that's something it had, they, they developed it fairly far along, or they were fairly far along in the development, and it hasn't gone anywhere since then. Then there was years ago, there was a USDA did a simulator they called DEFSIDE, Decision Evaluator for the Cattle Industry. There's Farrell and Jenkins over at Meat Animal Research were the primary um, researchers on that deal. Um, they used a, they actually used a simulator we had developed at Colorado State um, as part of the, as a backbone for it, but it never never really got off the ground. But but there you're getting into a deep thing, you're getting into simulation that goes deeper into biology, which is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is, ne it's needed, but it just, just doesn't seem like our industry has the, has the will to, to go anywhere with it. Yeah. Uh, Chip, back on that uh, certificate that you said you generate, <clears throat> a couple questions. You said you're going to have it where they have to put in inputs the dates that they wean the calf. So uh, will you have an output that will show that the calf is 68 days weaned, or is it just going to be that? I know, you, I know you've got to click on it, so you've got to be at least 30 days to trigger that part of the model. But on the certificate, will it actually show how many days weaned the calf is? Uh, and then next question would be, uh, uh, next question would be also since you know, on the, you're putting some just management type information on there about like implant status, 
Uh, will you also be putting a, a place on there for the the uh, seller to be able to disclose that they're using what what kind of vaccines is it modified live or killed? I know that doesn't factor into your model, but if you're just putting management information for the buyer to know uh, that you know they, we do see the, a differentiation in prices based upon some of that management information. Uh, no question, and you're spot on. And we've we've had those exact conversations, and and to this point, I. I think those are relatively things to just pass through, uh, relatively easy pieces. As far as like weaning, I, I would speculate we'll stick to a date only because that way it doesn't fluctuate every day. So if somebody, you know, sure. if they show that to somebody two weeks from now or four weeks from now, the, the wean date hasn't moved. And so, uh, but, okay. in terms but that wean date will be on the show. Yeah, that, that's something that's we had discussed a while back, and I just don't see any reason why we wouldn't do that. Um, it's easy. And then the vaccination program protocol, um, again, we've had that conversation. And, uh, again, we haven't necessarily solidified exactly what the certificate's going to look like. That's kind of the last piece of this whole thing. But I, at this point, there's a very high likelihood that exact thing will be on there. And then one last thing, uh, PI status, PI DVD status. You know, if you're putting pass-through information, that'd probably be another important one. Agreed. Yep. Guys, we, we've taken like two hours of your time now, so if there's maybe, <laughs> you got one more question, Mariah? You want well, to not so much question, and just but to wrap up, you know, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but I think there's definitely a place to use some of this and what we're doing. Um, you know, we're not so much calculating the relative value as I alluded to in the very beginning, but we're actually trying to figure a price for these people. But part of that um, price component is what is the value of their animal worth, what is, you know, being in the IB, being Charlay, having these sires. Um, and so I think that we would definitely like to continue working with y'all and, um, you know, and as you move forward and things are updated, be made aware of that um, so that we could use pieces of this in our pricing component you know, if we could work that out with y'all. Yeah, we're very, very happy to work, like I said. You know, when it comes to research, we're, we want to, you know, we want to collaborate, share, help in any way we can because we, you know, our, our IGS, really, the, the concept of IGS has to do with collaboration. You know, to think that you could get 12 breed associations to work together when, you know, typically, the history of breed associations has been more like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Um, <laughs> but but the, the, the goal, we, we, we realized long ago that, you know, if we really want to help the industry, we gotta, we got to work together. So, you know, if there's anything we can do to help you guys, you know, we'd certainly, certainly open to it. Well, we certainly appreciate you all taking yeah. time to walk all the way through this with us, and like Brian said, we're taking two hours of time. We know that your time is valuable, so thank you. Well, well worth it. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank we you. appreciate it a bunch. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Have a good day. All right. Bye bye. Bye. You still there? Thank you.